friends and welcome back to another episode. This is going to be another one of those laid back sort of casual videos where I'm going to talk about uh, something a little yarny while I also include a little bit of something not yarny. So the yarny thing we're going to talk about today is how to choose your yarn weights, how I choose them I should say. It's not really based in any expert knowledge, it's just how I choose my yarn weights and how different stitches affect how the garment is going to turn out. So I'm going to talk about that. At the same time, I'm going to discuss 10 non-yarny things about me. If you like this video, um, if you like this style, this chit chat, more casual style video, don't forget to hit the like button. Uh, while you're getting yourself settled, make yourself a tea, make yourself a coffee, make a snack. It's going to be a longer video. So uh, get your project ready and we can just sort of hang out together while I chat and you make. So I'm going to talk about 10 yarny things about me. I'm going to start with the non-yarny things. I'll do a yarny thing, a non-yarny thing, and we'll just keep going that way. And hopefully it doesn't end up being too, too long, but I do tend to be able to talk quite a while about yarn. So non-yarny things about me. I strive to live the life of an artist and a whimsical woodland fairy. So that's the truth. I basically want to live in the forest and run around barefoot all of the time. So I surround myself with plants. I go and collect moss in the forest and I've been really into making these terrariums lately, um, which have like bits of wood that have moss on them and rocks. And this one's actually bioactive. So it has worms and little isopods and plants growing in there as well. I've got an orchid, several native species that I just picked up on the forest floor, and then the dirt actually ended up having a whole bunch of living things in it. So that's something that I'm really enjoying lately that has nothing to do with yarn, um, but really feeds my soul. If you ever have the opportunity to build a bioactive terrarium, if that sounds something interesting to you, then uh, I do recommend it because it's it's very fun. Okay, so now into the yarn stuff. I wanted to talk about different yarn weights uh, to begin with. I don't have examples of the different yarn. Actually, I do have examples of the different yarn weights. Okay, so first I'm going to just talk about the different yarn weights that I know about. So I don't have any zero, like super fine, like just crochet thread thread, um, but I have the next step up, which is this like crochet gloss. It's, um, I believe this one is Patton's. Patton's? Does that make? Yeah, I think so. I think that's who this one's by. Um, I took the labels off. Last year, for some reason, I never, I didn't want any labels on my yarn, so a whole bunch of my yarn has no labels, which is, don't do that. If you're not using it, just leave the labels on until you use it, because you're going to want to know what you're using. Um, but this one would be good for really light garments or light shawls, throws, kind of scarves for springtime. I mean, you could make other stuff with it, but it's not going to be stretchy. This doesn't have any stretch to it. So it's better for things that you'd like wrap around yourself. You wouldn't want to make like an actual garment out of this because it's, it, it'll be very tight if you don't fit quite perfectly, unless you're making like an, a really oversized thing, but um, your hands will die because this is going to take way more stitches to complete a project because it's so, so fine. It is nice though, because it does offer a lot of drape to your fabric. So your fabric, when you're finished crocheting, it will have like a flowy uh, texture to it. Maybe a little whimsical. Moving on from there, we go up to, who would we go to next? I'm gonna say this one's thinner. Um, so this is a thin, it's like a two ply wool. I, I use mostly wool, by the way. So um, if that's not you, that's okay. but. I think it's still pretty much the same both ways. This is a two-ply, really thin wool. This is great for, um, again, flowy garments, like gappy, summery things. You do well to double it up if you were going to be making something a little bit more substantial, like an actual sweater. Use two, or if you're making like a baby blanket, use two th strands of something thin like this. But um, you can use a five millimeter hook even with a thin yarn like this and get a really gappy sort of breezy item of clothing. It's still going to be beautiful, it's just not going to be warm. And then we move up to these guys. This one's actually a 
hand dyed by a friend of mine in the Netherlands. So beautiful, isn't it? Um, this one's just a little bit thicker, a little bit plushier. Um, I think it's merino, that might be why. Uh, but this one would be great for some summer stuff. Uh, it's wool, so it is gonna be warm, maybe some spring stuff. Again, this is gonna be great for like gappy things, things that, are, that you want to have a lot of flow and drape and movement. Um, that sort of a yarn is gonna be great for that. Uh, the next two, this one is, they're different, but they're very similar. They, I didn't think they were when I started working with them, but I, I'm working on a sweater with this yarn now, and it's, it's almost as thick as uh, this one, which is still two ply, but it's like a, this one's probably a worsted weight, and this one's one up from a worsted weight, but not quite a chunky. Um, these guys are great for sweaters. Sweaters, shirt things, scarves, hats, this is, the weight I would go for most of the time, this is my go-to weight for yarn. Worsted or, worsted 0.5, I wanna say. Um, and then moving on from there is chunky, very chunky. This yarn, again, custom dyed by that same friend. And um, so super chunky is great for, what would it be good for? Things like headbands, really warm things. Maybe mittens, you wouldn't wanna be using this for Maybe you would. A sweater would probably be nice out of this, but you'd need a whole heck of a lot of it to make a sweater out of one of these guys because the yarn is so big and fat and chunky, you're going to go through it really quick. Like this ball of yarn is not going to go very far. It'll make a headband, maybe a pair of mittens or hand warmers. I don't think this is, would be enough for even a pair of leg warmers. So the bigger the yarn you go, the more space it takes up. You know what I mean? So I tend to stick to something about that size if I'm making garments. And then from there, there's just the big, fat, beautiful, extra chunky, almost, um, it's almost like a roving. It's not quite roving, it's, it's, it's spun, but it's, it's merino, this stuff is merino anyway, um, sent from another friend. Uh, these are all subscribers who have sent me this yarn, except this one, this is a custom dyed that I did. I dyed this one with rose petals and rose leaves turned out beige and green, so fun facts. Uh, but this one was also sent from another friend, subscriber. Um, extra chunky, like this, like super soft chunky. This is really nice for cowls. And I mean, it's nice for hats and I really like it for headbands. I made a headband, that's, this is just the scraps of what's left from a headband and a cowl. It's so cozy. I gave one to my sister for Christmas and she loves it and it's so soft. You just wanna like, you want it close to your face. So honestly, if I'm using something super chunky and soft like this, it's gonna be something that I get to like feel. So those are like the weights, very basically. Obviously, I'm no expert, so like don't go on my word for everything. Definitely do some more research. Oh, my tea is still hot, but it's chilly today. We've got such a snowy day here. I'm in Southern Ontario. And winter is just starting. We're in like the middle of January almost, and we're only just starting to get like snow that is sticking. I emotionally am not prepared for it. I am a summertime, springtime, falltime girl. I love the mud. I love going fishing and hiking and flipping over rocks to find salamanders and that sort of thing. And it's not that time of year right now. It's okay, I'm surviving because I'm surrounded by wool. Um, however, and plants. My plants are definitely keeping me sane. But I am looking forward to spring. Um, okay, number two, non-yarny things about me. I have a really smart dog. So my dog Thunder, he's a chihuahua. He's, he should be five pounds, but he's like seven pounds right now. He's a little overweight. Um, but he's beautiful on the inside. He's really smart. I don't know if you guys know this, but chihuahuas are dogs. Like people treat them like they're a toy. And when we got Thunder, you could tell that whoever had him before, we got him from a rescue, we were fostering him, we foster failed, and um, we kept him. Thunder, where are you? Thunder? Thunder, come here. Hello? He'll, he'll show up. Um, anyway, we got him from a shelter, not a shelter, a rescue. He was at a shelter, the rescue picked him up, and we fostered him. We failed at fostering him because he was so dang cute. And then I've taught him every trick in the book. Honest to goodness, he, oh, good morning. Hi, you wanna come sit with me? Come here, come on. You need help because it's a hard floor. I understand. 
understand. Come here. I'll help you. Hi. He's very smart though. Um, he knows obviously like sit, lie down, come here. He also knows stay. Don't you? You can have a kiss? Thank you. He knows to give a kiss. Can I have a high five? No. Can I have a real high five? Thank you. Can I have another real high five? High five. High five. High five. Thunder, give me a high Thank you very much. Okay, so he knows sit, lie down, roll over. He knows bang, which is like he pretends to get shot. Um, he knows us like stick him up. So what I do is I say stick him up. He puts his paws up and then I go bang. <laughs> falls over like he got shot. Um, he's overly excited when he's doing tricks though, so his tail's wagging, so he never like really looks like he got shot because he's very happy to be doing a trick. Um, roll over, he knows how to turn around when I tell him, he knows how to speak on command. What else do you know, mister? Oh, he knows how to, um, if I say clean your face, he'll take his paw and he'll wash his nose with it. I mean, I need to have food because he's very food motivated. Um, but if there's food around, he'll do anything. What else do you know, buddy? He looks like he doesn't know anything, but honestly, if you have a chihuahua and you think it's like a stupid dog, give it a try. Give training it a try, because I, I even taught Thunder to crawl. Like to, if I say, come here, and then I go, come here, shh. He'll crawl over, like it's a secret. And I think that's adorable. This year I want to work on show me your tummy. So when you go like this, they like show your tummy to get some tummy fats. He's such a chill puppy. Okay, so moving on from I have a very smart dog, I'm gonna start talking a little bit about some of the garments that I've made and how the yarn weight affected the garment and how I chose the yarn to go with that garment on purpose. So I'm gonna start with this guy right here. So this was all done in single crochet with a worsted weight, something maybe a little bit, just, just slightly thicker than a worsted weight. And by doing it in a single crochet, it ends up being really, um, I don't wanna, I don't know how to say, not drapey, it's very stiff. So it has a lot of shape to it. If you're making something that you have, like you want structure in it, like I really wanted these puffy sleeves to, to stay puffy when I'm wearing it. I wanted it to be visibly a puffy sleeve. I wanted there to be a lot of structure in that sleeve. So I picked a yarn that was bigger to go with a stitch that's tighter so that there would be that stiffness. Um, and I really like how that turned out. I, I think it worked really well for this garment. And it's a crop sweater, so I wanted it to be pretty clearly like a stiff crop sweater. So if you want something that's stiffer, like, like a structural garment, or if you're making something with like a wide neckline and you don't want it to fall off your shoulders, something stiff. I would recommend going with something like a worsted weight and a single crochet is a really cool way to go to get some really structural designs. Also though, if you use single crochet and you make something much larger, you're going to get more drape in it. So I'm gonna use this one as an example. This one's also done in single crochet, but this is, an extra large men's sweater. So it has way more weight than this cropped sweater does. So the structure of the sweater ends up being kind of lost in the weight. It's good because for this sweater, it's not meant to be super structural. You can see the sleeves still have a really defined shape. There's no like slouching. It's very like a flat garment. Um, but the body piece has a lot more, not movement, but a lot more drape to it. You can see there's a lot more availability of it not looking totally stiff, which is good because you don't necessarily want a big oversized sweater to look really boxy. This way it's not too, too boxy, but it's really warm. A single crochet with a worsted weight, if you're using wool, honestly, I can wear this out without a coat, probably down to like five degrees Celsius, which is pretty chilly. Um, it's probably in the 30s, right? 30s Fahrenheit. I mean, I think 32 is zero, right? So five is probably 40. I don't know how your system works, America, but it's probably like 40 degrees. Until 40 degrees, let's say, I could go out in this with wind and no wind makes it in when you're using a single crochet. I really do like how, how the single crochet holds together for men's sweaters. I find it, 
it drapes over like men's pecs really well, giving like a really nice shape. It looks really like it's handsome. It, it looks high quality um, on a man's body. I mean, on a on my body, it looks like a dress, and I'm totally cool with that. That's how I wear it. But if I wear it with jeans and a hat, it it can keep me very warm outside. A cowl too, because I made that one a little bit of a lower neck. So I would say for like a worsted weight four four weight wool, which for this one I use Briggs and Little regal weight wool and I custom dyed all of the skeins with plants so we've got like some walnut dye walnut dye walnut dye with different mordens and then what was this one I think this was walnut dye the exhaust bath and then from there what did we get brown with I can't remember light brown with something and then these greens here Japanese maple, avocado, Japanese maple, and then it just sort of patterns out. But this one, I do like how the single crochet really like holds it together in a, in a bit of a stiffer way. It just doesn't have the drape. So moving on from a single crochet, we've got half double crochet. So this one is still super warm. This is my favorite sweater. I don't know if you can tell it's been worn forever. I've been wearing this one ever since I made it. I wear it multiple times a week. Um, and it's Oh, it's so cute. This again, it's in Briggs and Little. All of my stuff right now is made from Briggs and Little because last year I just went ballistic ordering yarn and I ordered just an obscene amount of Briggs and Little wool and I worked my way through it. So half double crochet, it gives a bit of a softer drape, I find. It's got less stiffness than um, what a single crochet has. Maybe it's because my tension is not as tight for half double as I end up having it for single. Mm. I'm drinking this mango green tea now, by the way, and it is like, it's really good. I'm not really a fan of green tea, to be honest, like for the most part. Um, I think it tastes like seaweed a lot of the time, but this mango, not mango, pomegranate green tea. Did I say mango? I did. Pomegranate green tea, very yummy. It's like warm juice. Um, oh, side note, we should talk about something non-yarny about me before I, before I dive into the half double crochet. Also, while we're here, check out this adorable Oxalis triangularis. I stole some of the little bulbs from my mom. She has this big plant and I noticed that they grow from little bulbs. So I pulled a couple of them out of her plant. I put them in a dirt in a window and they fully are so happy here. They even put out a flower. I really love this plant. It's so delicate. Like watch. It's like, like lettuce or like butterfly wings. Like you can barely touch it without it breaking. So um, I have to be gentle around it, which is kind of different for me. Okay. Um, oh, here we go. Number three, I have terrible night vision. This is something I learned about myself recently um, <laughs> because I don't usually drive at night. I don't have to. Usually Alex, my partner, does most of the- oh sorry, sorry, I elbowed you right in the brains. Uh, he does most of the um, driving because he likes to drive and I don't hate driving or anything. I just- he likes to drive so I don't have to for the most part. But this week I've been doing a ton of driving because I've had lots to do, errands to run and whatnot. And, um, I am mostly blind when driving at night. Oh my goodness. Twice now I've driven at night and I was like, maybe the first time I was just nervous. Nope. If a car's coming towards me, I can barely see anything. So note to self, not going to be a nighttime driver. I am going to make an appointment with an optometrist though, because I never, I have really good vision. Like I thought I had really good vision. I think I have really good vision, but night vision, I guess it's a different thing because the lights are just they just bleed into everything so that if there's headlights toward me, I can't see anything around them even. And I don't think that that's how it's supposed to be. And it's not like they had high beams on. It was like everywhere. I was okay in the city because in the city there's like street lights. So the whole brightness of the like atmosphere is brighter. But um, in the country, which is where I live, it's very, is a striking difference. So note to self, don't drive at night, um, but also, something non-yarny that I recently learned about myself. Okay, back to these sweaters. So this one's in half double crochet. 
Uh, it's also been washed a bunch of times, so it might not be like 100%. Oh, actually, this one's been washed 100 times, so we'll compare these two. We've got single crochet and half double. If you see, the half double has like a lot more softness to it. It's like, it's a softer, more malleable kind of, I don't have a lot of words right now for some reason, um, but it's more, more drapey. It has a lot more movement to it. When you wear it, it's not like just a square. It, it has some whimsicalness. I mean, maybe the colors are what makes it whimsical, but it, it moves a lot better. It moves a lot more um, readily. Oh, this is inside out. I'll just pretend the seams aren't on the outside right now. It's fine. But yeah, so half double would be something I would recommend for like most people for like a basic cardigan or a sweater. If you're making a sweater, just start with half double. It is the easiest way to build quickly. Single crochet takes a lot longer to build up, so it ends up taking you more time to make your garment. Whereas half double crochet, it builds really quickly. It does use more yarn, obviously, because you're wrapping around the hook an additional time. But that little bit of, um, it gives a little more fluffiness to your garment, like a little more puffiness as opposed to just stiff, small rows. So for most things, I recommend half double crochet for most like sweatery garment type things. I'm surrounded by sweaters. I'm just gonna put the ones that I'm done talking about down. No, I'm not, because I might have to reach for them again. I'll put some of them down. Okay, so now I'm going to move into um, how I use finer wools, like finer weight wools, um, which usually, as I was explaining before when I was talking about the weights, I usually use those for like thinner things that I want to have a little bit more drape. So one of those, I'm gonna move from the half double crochet, is this half double? Hold on. Yeah, half double. Okay, from half double crochet with a worsted weight, sorry, I had to stare at it for like a quick sec, to half double crochet with a sport weight or like a, it's probably like two on the yarn scale, like from one to five, five being really chunky. Um, so it's like a two weight. And um, this with the half double crochet, it gives really beautiful drape. This is another puffy sleeve sweater. I really, I don't know if you can tell, I really like puffy sleeves. I find them to be whimsical is like my go-to word right now, but basically whimsical. I find them to have a lot of um, like a cute energy that I really like. So another puffy sweater, a puffy sleeve, and this one, it doesn't have the structure of that first one, but it does have this beautiful drape that makes it flow. And you can see how big the, the sleeve actually is when I hold it out like this, but when it's on you, it doesn't give you that, that giant, like a, 1980s bride dress. It's it's much more subtle and cozy. It looks like a big cozy sweater. Um, I love how it hangs and it's still really warm because it's in half double. Half double means there's an extra wrap around your hook versus single crochet and that allows more wool to be in one spot, less air passes through, you stay warmer. So that's a half double with the sport weight. Next, I'm going to move on to um, my, yeah, my chain stitch garments. So when I want something to be like really, really drapey, drapey is gonna be a big word and I don't know, it's gonna be a long, a big word in this video. When I want something to have a lot more drape, <clears throat> I'll do a chain one and then a double crochet. If you do a double crochet, you're gonna get a nice gappy, like light, moving garment. If I want it to be even more gappy and light, what I like to do is a double crochet, chain one, double crochet, chain one, and then on the following row, double crochet in the chain one space, and then chain one, double crochet in the chain one space, and move on and on until you get a finished garment. And it gets, it's more gappy, still like surprisingly warm. Like I was wearing this in the fall outside and I mean, my arms were cold, but like for the photo shoot, I was like very comfortably warm for this one. Um, and you can see light passes through it. Maybe you can't see from your end, but I'm not totally obscured 
behind this, so you would need to wear like something underneath. This is not a, a, a naked sweater. Um, but compared to the half double, it's got way more movement. It just sort of flows. And this one, therefore, will show your body shape a lot more. If you're trying to like show off your curves or something, and you want <clears throat> something a little, something not fitted, but it's still gonna like hang off you like kind of sexy, this would be more the right direction because it'll follow the curvature of your body as opposed to the single crochet, which is just, it's very boxy. It won't highlight any assets, if you know what I'm saying, um, but it's cozy and warm and cute. This is more like an actual like garment. It's not like a sweater. It's more like this would be good for garments like this one, which is the turkey top, turkey tee turkey tail top. Also all hand dyed yarn that I dyed with plants. I really like this one. Um, moving from there, I'm gonna go even gappier, which is, no, I'm not gonna do that one. This one, the mo, oh, actually, before we go to the next gappy, let's do another yarny, not yarny thing about me. <laughs> I very rarely read instructions. That's the next one. So I have, like a fatal flaw where I, I really struggle with instructions. It's just not my strong suit. I am um, forever plagued with the fact that I, I just keep trying it until something happens, until it works, and it doesn't always work. And like my sewing machines, I tried to clean them on my own, ended up with extra pieces when I put them back together because it didn't read any instructions. And now they're at a repairman shop. So read some instructions, probably good advice, but I don't. I tend to just sort of poke around at it until it works, whatever it is. That's why I design my own crochet stuff as opposed to following patterns because when I follow patterns, I always end up deviating from them anyway. I've tried, but I always end up going like, this would be nicer if it had X, Y, Z, you know? And then I add, those things. So I have like a go-to sleeve pattern that I made that I'm, I pretty much use it exclusively now because it's, it's like fairly easy and it's, it's a good sleeve pattern. So I do reuse patterns, but for the bodies of, uh, of garments, I very rarely have an instruction before I start, which is kind of, um, why everything tends to look a little bit different when you see my patterns because I have no idea what's gonna happen when I get started on them. Also, next, I have, I get mildly obsessed with my hobbies. So this is, again, a fatal flaw, but it's also something that I'm pretty cool with about myself. Um, I used to really like nail polish, so I bought a million nail polishes. I bought one of those lights to do your uh, you know, the, what's that stuff called? The UV gel stuff, not UV gel, the shellac. I bought all the stuff for shellac, got really into it, and that was like my hobby for a while. Then I got out of it, got really into makeup, and I was like, I would have on fleek eyebrows, I would have a full face of foundation, like contour, highlight, I was just fully done, and I had way too much makeup. Then it turned into just lipstick. And I, at one point, and this is like insane, I'm aware. So you don't need to like comment the fact that it's insane. I had hundreds of lipsticks. Like I'm not a beauty guru. I am not someone who is a beauty YouTuber. Like I purchased each one of these hundreds of lipsticks. Obviously I bought them on sale at the drugstore most of the time, but like I did have Sephora and Mac ones too not too many, most of them were drugstore. I would wait until they went on sale for like $2.99 and then I'd buy like 10. Um, so lipstick was the next one. Fell out of love with lipstick, not really, but now I just wear it when like I'm going out. I'm not, I used to wear it like every day, even if I was like at home. Now, uh, it went into yarn next. That was several years ago, and now I am so happy to be obsessed with yarn. That hasn't faded, which is why I have a YouTube channel that um, surrounds itself with yarn mostly. Um, and the next one, the newest hobby in the list is plants. Plants are my current obsession. I really dove headfirst into plant keeping. All right, sorry, I ended up talking too long and then the, uh, the camera died, so I'm back. Ugh. 
in my comfy farm farm jeans. Come here. So yeah, plants. I ended up talking to the camera for like several minutes um, after it stopped recording. So I'm gonna just kind of try and pick up where I left off. Plants, I love them. I really, really take really good care of them. Like I obsess over them because again, one of my non yarny things, I obsess over my hobbies and I cut, get fully engulfed into them. So like natural dyeing, I got really into that this summer and like I have stores, like storage amounts of rainwater from this summer because now I'm like super into the natural aspect. I have a, a big like 10 gallon bucket in my basement full of rotting black walnuts with water because I wanna see how dark I can get the dye. I live in a house now which has a um, like a root cellar. So it's fine, it's not like it smells like anything. It's cold down there and also black walnuts are kind of astringent so there's no real smell. Um, but they have been sitting in there for months. I have been make, I have experiments for natural dye just going all the time. So that's a hobby that I haven't lost yet. Yarn is a hobby I haven't lost yet and I really hope I don't lose plants. I'm really into them. I love the idea of bioactive terrariums because it's like I have pets that I don't need to have a huge responsibility for. Like I wanna have a million and a half dogs, but like that's not realistic. So plants is kind of like replacing the want to have a dog or a cat, um, a new dog or a cat, I have a dog and a cat, because I still have to look at them every day, make sure that they don't have any pests, make sure that they are healthy and watered. Watering is not a problem for me, I'm an overwaterer, an avid overwaterer, but that's okay. All right, so next I want to show a really gappy, super gappy. So this one is my really cozy sweater dress. Um, again, really deceivingly warm for how gappy the stitches are. This one is a, what did we do for this one? Single crochet chain, one, two, three. Single crochet chain three, single crochet chain three, and the following row, I did the single crochet in the chain three space and that made this almost, it looks like a net to be honest, it's kind of like a net, um, which I love. It's super cute and it's very comfortable. Again, I did the puffy sleeve with this one. Again, it doesn't have the structure of something like single crocheted or even something half double crocheted, but it has some beautiful drape to it. Like it's almost like a scarf. You can see how light and fluffy it is. So this one looks great with a long sleeve shirt and tights underneath or a tank top and tights again. I wear it with anything though. I wear it with jeans. Um, it kind of has a cape like shoulder. I, I made it so the shoulder like comes forward so that the back kind of hangs like a cape. And I added a little tie in the middle to bring it in because it is very, um, very large. I made it very large. So all of these are, by the way, are on the channel as patterns. So if you want to like have better in-depth information about each individual one, the patterns are available on the channel. Just search sweaters and they should all come up. I'll put them all in a playlist, I think, because that would be helpful, I think. Um, also, if you're new here, don't forget to subscribe. I put out new videos like once a week, edited videos, and I live stream Monday to Friday, 7 a.m. Eastern time until around 8.30 a.m. There's a pretty good sized community of people there now and we chat while we get ready for our day. I usually talk about what I'm gonna do that day or what I'm looking forward to, what I'm working on, and then we all chat about just what's going on. It's just kind of a fun environment to be in in the morning or if you're across the pond in the afternoon, but Northern Hemisphere, the west side of the Northern Hemisphere, it's morning when we hang out. So subscribe, hit the little bell if you want to be notified um, of when the video comes out because normally I make it 7 a.m. I pretty much have exclusively made them 7 a.m. Um, for the last year anyway. Like my edited videos and my live streams start at 7. So um, yeah, subscribe. And like the videos because that's super helpful and comment on the videos. If you like the channel and you want to support, but you don't want to support financially, 
Comment on videos, interact with your YouTube friends, interact with the people that you watch on YouTube. Not just me, I mean like in general, it's a really good way. In, YouTube is like the new TV, right? And in TV you get advertising and you pay for your channels. YouTube, you get a little bit of advertising, but you don't pay for your channels. So a way to, I don't know, pay it forward in a way because it's not being like paid for the way like traditional TV is, interact with the videos, like the videos that you like, comment on the videos you like. If there's something that you like about the video, mention it because it's super helpful for the YouTuber, me, and it's also really good for the algorithm, like the video in general, the, the channel. It's really helpful to get advice from viewers like you. If you hate something about a video, be nice. I mean like constructive criticism, but if you like something about a video, it feels so good to be able to receive some positive reinforcement from your viewers, um, especially when, you know, you read 10 nice comments, you get one negative one, kicks you in the pants a little bit. So leave nice comments on the videos you like because it's super, super helpful for the emotional well-being of your YouTube friends and also it helps the video. So yeah, like the video, comment, you know the drill, all that stuff. So let's do another non-yarny thing about me. Oh, there's my fridge making noise. Hmm. I'm messy, but I'm clean. Um, in that I like my floors to be swept. I like there to be no dust on like my picture frames. I like to have clean mirrors and clean windows, but like I have stuff everywhere. Like this amount of plants, there's just an obscene amount in my living room and I have yarn everywhere, but it's in piles and it's off the floor. My, my way of being clean is having tabletops clean and floors clean. If that's clean, everything else is fine for me. I mean, I, I wash clothes, like stuff is clean, but I mean, I am a mess. Usually there is like, my desk is chaos and my plant room is currently chaos. This is supposed to be my filming room, but it ended up being my plant room. It's fine currently, it's my filming room. I moved a chair in here and here we are. So it's a filming room, but I'm a mess, but I'm also clean. Is anyone else like that? Messy, but clean. I'm not neat, but I'm clean, you know? That's me. Oh, here's another fun one. I rip off my nails when I'm anxious. So as you guys may have noticed, if you've been around here for a while, um, I film overhead videos of my hands while I do tutorials for crochet things. And sometimes people will be like, yuck, your hands are nasty. And I'm like, oops, I didn't do any maintenance on my hands before doing a video because I was just feeling inspired to film. I didn't really necessarily think about how my hands appear. Um, sometimes I do, sometimes I'll paint my nails or I've even had fake nails on in a few videos because mm, I was feeling jazzy. But oh my goodness, this winter has been a bit, or this fall I guess, has been putting me through the ringer and I have been just tearing my nails off. I don't bite them, I just pick at them and now they are like, like a hobbit. I look like a hobbit. My, na my hands look extra short and my fingernails are like right up to the nail bed. Whenever I have like a, a terribly anxious time, I rip them all off. So right now I'm in a situation where they're too short to even glue fake nails on. Um, so the next few videos you may notice my nails are very short. It just means that I'm having a hard time. So it's not necessarily something that it's helpful to comment on. Go ahead, I don't care. I'm pretty confident in my anxiety. Like if people are like, your nails are gross. I'm like, I have anxiety, I don't know what to tell you. It's just like my freckles, I can't get rid of them. So um, I'm gonna try and grow them back out, have long nails again, but the next time a very anxious time comes up, I'm gonna rip them all off again. Ooh, here's a fun one. I can read any animal. So if I see an animal, wild or not, I can tell what's what's going on. I can tell if a dog is gonna let me pet it, like if it's energy, like I can read animal energy and I can, um, animals gravitate towards me. Like thunder, like I'm sitting here talking to a camera and he is like chill. Like, I don't know if you can like fully see him. I'll move my book. But he's like a chill little guy right now. He has like not a ton of stress. Like, 
Look at this guy. You're the cutest thing in the world, you know. But um, I think it has to do with the fact that I, I listen to animals. I have a weird thing where I have a trouble listening to humans. Uh, I have trouble holding like a sit down conversation with eye contact for a long time with humans, but I will learn animals and I will adapt to what they want. Like Thunder was really skittish when we got him and, and shy. And so I was gentle with him. I never picked him up without asking him. I've never pulled on his feet, his ears, his tail, that sort of stuff. And he trusts implicitly now, you know, like he wants to be around me all the time. The cat didn't like to be held. So if I picked him up and he pushed away, I would let him go as opposed to like holding him and making him sit with me. And now he is hyper social with me. He always wants to sit with me because he knows if even for any reason he wants to leave, he's free to go. And I'm, I don't know, I, I adapt to animals really well. I have really good communication skills with non-human animals. I should say non-human mammals. I do my best with reptiles. I think birds I'd probably be okay with, but reptiles, they're a little harder to read. You know, a snake's eyes don't really do a lot with their pupils, so it's kind of hard to understand what's going on in their head. But mammals, non-human mammals, I would say I am like a, like a mammal whisperer, non-human mammal whisperer. Um, next one, I have a really good memory, like a creepily good memory, like, like I can't forget things. Um, sometimes it's a blessing, sometimes it's not a blessing because I, I can't forget things ever. Um, which is, it's, it's kind of cool because I can pull details from really long ago events, um, from pretty much like when memory begins, I have very clear memories of a lot of things and it's been a benefit for me because for certain things like for example I was like nine when my grandma passed away and my little sister's a year and a half younger than me so she was like eight maybe just turned eight or she's seven just about to oh no she just turned eight because she her birthday's in December my grandma had passed away in December so she had just turned eight and I have many clear like dialogue memories with like I can imagine the environment I can imagine the colors I can imagine like things like that like tastes and smells and my little sister and my little cousin have very very limited memory of my grandma and like that's a blessing because she was an awesome person and it's good to have memories like that so it's a benefit in those ways the ways that it's negative you might be able to imagine is if somebody slights me or if I am wronged by someone, it's very hard for me to wash over it. I can forgive people, but it's very hard for me to, to move past things because I can remember exactly how I felt in situations and I can remember ex like exactly what people say, which is like dangerous. I feel bad for Alex because like he could never win a fight. We don't fight much, but I mean, he wouldn't stand a chance in an argument anyway because I know every detail of like every moment of our relationship forever. So yeah, and not just that, like everything, like all of the things that I've experienced, I really can like be in that moment again. It just got brighter out. So sorry if the lighting's been crappy until now. It's snowing and the sky is dark, but I guess there was a break in the clouds. So enjoy the moment of bright lighting. Also enjoy my, cat eye, I did a wing that could cut a person because um, I have this new eyeliner that is from Avon. Thank you, Ariel. My uh, sister-in-law gave it to me for Christmas. And um, this eyeliner that's like a, it's like a felt tip pen. And um, I mean, it wasn't easy for me to use because like I have not been doing eyeliner in a very long time, but I'm pretty even, pretty confident with the evenness of my cat eye. It's going to be a pain to wash off tonight, but we're going to deal with that later. So there's that. Mm. Oops. I'm going to show, um, what am I going to show? I guess I will show this. This guy here is a scarf. It was going to be a dress. Oh, I should address this as well. Paulette, one of our longtime, uh, longtime subscribers and longtime live stream um, friends 
she was asking about a yellow dress recently in one of my videos and I never made the dress. I went looking for this dress that she had mentioned. I designed a dress that I was going to make with this. I ended up not. I ended up re-blocking this square to make it extra long, like I re-blocked it stretched out with my blocking mat and my knit, knit, what are they called? Knit pins? They have a name, knit blockers? Maybe they're knit blockers. Anyway, um, these pins that you stick in when the, the garment is wet. and. Um, I pinned it out to be a scarf, so I never ended up making it. All of this is also hand dyed yarn, if you can't tell, I'm obsessed with natural dye and hand dyeing my own yarn now. It's like one of my favorite things, using my own yarn and being like, if someone says, oh that's nice, I'm like, it's made from onion skins, I'm like maybe a little bit braggy about it, but at the same time, <clears throat> very proud. But this one is a uh, single crochet, no it's not, it must be half double crochet but it's been pulled super tight. So you can also modify um, the drape of a fabric. So you can see the, the, the body and the drape that this one has by blocking them a certain way. So I pulled the stitches as tight as I could get them like that and then I blocked it. So you can see there's like this gap between the stitches but that's not from like a chain one or anything. It's just because I pulled it. So if I pull the other way, it, it stretches back that way but I don't do that, I keep it pulled this way. And it doesn't move on its own. So when I wash it, it comes back to this way now. It doesn't go like revert back, but you could pull it out and make it go back to being the half double crochet, but I just, I like it gappy like this. And it modified the, uh, the whole look of the scarf and it modified the whole drape of the fabric, which is why originally I was thinking a dress would be kind of cool in this. So there's another thing for um, how you can modify your garment to go with yarn weights that you want to use. Like if you want to use a certain stitch but you want it to be showing up a different way, you can do different things with blocking, pulling the pieces apart. Okay, and number 10, we're going to round it off with this one. I love knowing edible medicinal plants and other survival stuff. Like I am like, I'm not a survivalist, like I don't have like a like a bug out bag or anything like that. But I have so many books on like medicinal plants from North America or edible flowers in Ontario or all the mushrooms of Ontario. I love collecting books like that because I love that kind of knowledge. Encyclopedias and um, books that talk about um, like cures from indigenous populations for like maladies and things like that or, or books that talk about pharmaceuticals that are made from organic compounds that we've got growing around here. Uh, I love that stuff and I love knowing it. I love going through the forest and being like, that's sheep sorrel, like either to myself or whoever I'm walking with. Oh yes, this fern is edible, but only in the spring months. I love that. I love knowing which one's a fiddlehead fern. I love knowing that sort of thing. And I love collecting things that are edible and that are medicinal. Currently, I have several different medicinal herbs hanging in my basement, hanging upside down. They're dry now, but I hung them to dry in the summertime and I haven't packaged them yet. I have some mint, I have some wild aster, I have dandelion, I have, what else do I have down there? I have heal all, which is a plant, heal all, interesting. But I love knowing that stuff. I love the idea that if the world changed drastically and I needed to survive in the wild, not in the winter, that's crazy talk, but in the summer, let's be honest, if I go camping, if I go extreme camping, that's as far as it's gonna get, I could survive on mostly plants. I mean, I could fish. I would need to figure out what to do for the, uh, like, thread. No, I could probably make it out of like a plant thing. I love doing that too, like making wreaths out of willow or making string out of vines by rolling cord. That sort of thing is totally my vibe. I like, I should have been Boy Scout. That would have been really good for me, honestly. Um, I was a super tomboy growing up. I was always in, sorry, if you see me glancing off this way, I'm, my view is of my backyard, which is like a hundred acres of field and a forest. So I just have a beautiful view of the snow right now. So if you catch me not looking at the camera, it's because 
I have a beautiful view. Anyway, um, I was always in a swamp, catching leeches, catching turtles, catching snapping turtles. I honestly should be missing at least a couple of fingers with the life that I've lived, but I'm not. Somehow I have managed to not lose any fingers or toes. Or I should have like Lyme disease. The number of animals that have bitten me that I've not dealt with properly. I mean, now that I'm an adult, obviously, um, that's not something that I do, but when I was a kid, Jesus, I was fairly risk-taking as a little mud wanderer. I loved doing that, though. I loved finding clams in my pond growing up. There were these clams or mussels or something. They were like, like a clam, you know, like two shells and a tongue on the inside. That was the animal. And I would take, I would collect them because they lived in the mud and I like hiked around the mud in the water. Um, and I would collect them, I would take them home, I would wash them off, and then I would take a toothbrush and a little bit of Dawn soap. I was really careful with them because I like really liked them. And I would scrub down the outside of the shell. And then I would clean them off and I would take them back to the pond and I would let them go because I wanted them to be healthy and happy. Like I would take all the leeches off of them. I would catch turtles pull all the leeches off of them and then let the turtles go. And like, <laughs> that was like a thing that I did every summer when I was a kid. Or I would go to a friend's house who always had a pregnant cat. It seemed like this cat had had to have, or multiple cats probably, they were feral. And I would rehome the cats every summer, the kittens. I would go and get them and I would bring them around the neighborhood and I would get people to have free kittens. and. It was just something I loved doing. And I would go through the pond um, collecting sticks or seeds or flowers or whatever I was looking for. And I would find the goose and duck nests in the spring and I would just sit there and stare at them. And if there were new babies, oh God, I would just sit there for hours and just stare at these babies. I would coax them over to me and then I would be able to like, I was like the goose whisperer, honestly. I guess I can speak bird. Cause I, the geese at that pond, I could like, I could have my hand out and I could like grab their beaks and just do this. And they would just stick around me and I could like feed them grass or whatever I would bring down from the house. And they hung out with me. Like I would like chill with geese. Like I could pet wild geese from my pond because I was there so much. They were just like, oh, there's that mud lover again. And I loved fishing there too. So I caught my first pike. Anyway, um, I don't know how we got on that tangent, but that's a non yarny thing about me. I love plants and animals so much that um, it's like a huge part of my soul, I think, is being out in the wild playing with dirt and associated things. Dirt and bugs and animals. Baby animals. But. That's 10 yarny things about me, and that's, uh, I hope, kind of an explanation of how I pick yarn for a project, kind of an explanation of the different yarns that I use, and different ways that you can make the yarn that you're using work for a project you're using. Um, again, if you're making a sweater, I do recommend to start with like a worsted weight, start with half double crochet. That's going to be your easiest way to start with a garment. To make yourself a sweater that is super easy to make, just half double crochet, the width of your body plus six inches, and make two rectangles that go from your hip to the top of your shoulder. Sew those two rectangles together at the shoulder and at the sides, and you've got a shirt now. And then if you want to, you can make two additional rectangles that make it all the way around your arm plus three inches, and then you just make them as long as your arm, and then you sew them into that space easy peasy but the first garment you make honestly just just make two squares that's what this one is let me show you this one is just two rectangles there's no shaping on this at all um and the actual shape of the garment ends up looking super cute this is just two rectangles sewn together and then i did a row of single crochet around the edge of the armhole that i made and it ends up looking like like a totally cool handmade 
garment. So I hope that helped, or at least I hope it was entertaining. I hope that you got some work done on one of your projects, or at least you had tea and had a little bit of a relaxing moment with us today, with us, me and Thunder, I guess. Thunder and I, grammar. Um, however, that's all I've got. So I will see you tomorrow, and uh, I hope you like it. If you do, like the video, subscribe, hit the bell, all that. Share it if you wanna be jazzy, but I'm all over the place on social media. At lastminutelaura.ca is everywhere that you can find me. Instagram, I'm at lastminutelaura.ca. Twitter, I'm at lastminutelaura.ca. Facebook, lastminutelaura. And um, of course, YouTube, lastminutelaura. So have a great rest of your day. I will see you tomorrow. Love you all. And don't forget to drink some water today. Stay hydrated. I think that's all. Okay, bye.